Well done. Thank y'all for your, your time because I know you've been practicing. And I know it's a struggle to get up here in front of people sometimes, or just about all the time. But thank you for your confidence in coming in here and, uh, you know, if nothing else, loved ones, the, the very sweet, sweet spirit. Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. Amen. And is that, is that making sense? The very sweet, sweet spirit. Of our youth coming Amen. into reading today. Well, like I said, we're going to be on a journey this morning, <clears throat> and the journey starts around 2 Samuel chapter 7. And we're talking about David this morning and <clears throat> David's experiences. And I'll explain to you shortly why I'm on this horse this morning, but it's, it's, it's not quite time for that preparation yet, so just, just hold out and I'll let you know. <clears throat> But God's promise to David is what we're looking at today. We know a little history on David. We know some of the circumstances that, that went around David and his kingship and his appointment and, and how he was brought into to kingship and, and Saul and the experience that was there and then David's respect for Saul, but Saul's absolute horrid attempts at trying to, to kill David. And you know, this king has come in and there's a lot of analogies here that uh, we're going to get to. Um, I'm not sure if we'll get to all of them, but we'll get to, to some of them for sure. And, and the analogies of a king, for, for one, for a king that's taking over a dominion from another king. Because that's really what's happened here. And the rights and privileges that come from that king who's taken over a, another king's dominion. And, and what they would normally do in that circumstance, in that day, how that would happen. You see, quite often it is that, that what, what, would, what would happen was, is this new regime would come in, this new king would come in, and there would still be descendants, of course, even though the other king might have been dealt, done away with or, or imprisoned or head chopped off or, or, or just completely dead, there might have been some descendants there. There might have been a, a sister, a brother, a, a, a child or something, and what would happen is this new king would normally call out any relative. He'd come into power and he would call out whatever relatives there were and, and have them killed. That was just the reality of that day. So therefore there would never be like this little set group over here of, of the old followers of Saul, so to speak, and the old respecters of, of Saul and the old king could get over here and start to get a militia together to try to overthrow the current king because they appreciated their, their father's legacy, or they thought they were entitled to something, maybe, um, because of their father's legacy. I hope you can start to see some of that um, analogy that we're talking about when we use that word, entitled to something because of maybe their father's legacy. You know, we suffer from that, certainly, in our American culture, is that we think we're entitled to all the freedoms that we have as a culture. And a lot of times we forget the, the fights and the battles and the wars as we had Memorial Day, just pass by us. Sometimes we forget all that was sacrificed to provide these freedoms and we wake up every morning with them and think that we're entitled to them, that there was nothing given, there was nothing in exchange for this freedom that we have. And, and, and on a deeper, in a spiritual basis, you know we talk about this quite often, we wake up and breathe the air that God provided and, and absorb the sunshine that He provided and somehow think that we're entitled to the sun coming up tomorrow as if it's not a gift. Loved ones, it's a gift. It's a gift that it comes up. Well, what we see in David's heart here is that he knew who the provider was. Now, now we can go in and a lot of times we spend a lot of time talking about the God after the, the man after God's own heart in David. And that's what the scripture says. That's what God said. So, in fact, that's what he is. And when we do that, I know we, we automatically jump to all of his inadequacies, and that's how we normally present David is, you know, his sin with Bathsheba, his choices, his, his having someone killed and Uriah, and all that. And we just kind of skip to that type of a dynamic, and we don't ever get to the core of what it is that made David a man after God's own heart. This morning, I want to look at some of the realities of why David was called a man after God's own heart. You see, he had just got through with great struggles and great darknesses. And we read about a lot of those darknesses in the Psalms where he's praying out and crying out and, and people are pursuing him. 
And in this pursuit, he's saying, you know, God, they pursue me and, and I, I'm constantly awake. I never get any rest. I never get any sleep because I never quite have the confidence of knowing that they might be right on my back or right on my shoulder or know my hiding place. Or, and then in, in his prayer, you see the beauty of all of his prayers is that they move from this physical concern, this physical crying, this I need you, I need you to Father God, surely, surely mercy and grace will pursue me all the days of my life. Meaning, though they're in pursuit of me, if I can get my focus off of their pursuit and recognize your pursuit, there's two pursuits going on. God, I think I'll stop and let you catch up. Amen. I, I, think, I think I'll stop. And we see that beauty. And if you don't believe it, read them. Read the Psalms. Read the prayers of David. And, and, and with that in mind, with, with trying to see how it shifts from humanism to belief in God. And trust in God. And faith in God. That's one of the ways, but that's not the way we're looking at this morning. Chapter 7. <clears throat> Second Samuel. After the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the ark remains in a tent. Now let's make sure that we understand that the, the whole precepts are here. After the king was settled in his palace, Settled. Anybody ever moved? <laughs> How long does it take to get settled sometimes? You still got stuff in boxes. Amen. <laughs> because when we move from one place to the next, we realize, boy, I got a lot of junk. You know, I don't think there's any other culture, any other culture that has a multi-billion dollar business of storage units. Yeah. Yeah, 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 amen? Yeah. It's a multi-billion dollar business. You know, you know what storage units are in Cambodia? Houses. Houses. And there would be posh, plush, posh accommodations in those countries. And we use them for storage. And then we're concerned they've got dirt, dirt ground. And those, those people will be like, the rain doesn't come in? I can deal with the dirt. It's got a wall? i got some kind of privacy? Well, that's where we put our junk. That's where we put the stuff that we don't need, quite honestly. And now there's television shows where they sell the things off because the people who had them just like, you know what? I've been paying for that storage unit. So I'm not paying for that storage unit no more. I don't know what I'm going to do with the stuff in it, but I'm not going to pay for that storage unit no more. And then they sell off the stuff in it. And, and, and yeah, you might be convicted. I don't know. You got a storage unit, anybody? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to beat you up. <laughs> but but I, 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 I guarantee you, if you do have a storage unit, if you were to try to list on paper what was in it, how successful do you think you would be? But our focus it seems to be on those things, though, right? We had to have them, had to get them, had to collect them, and had to. Loved ones, I'm here to tell you, and I believe this with all the core of my being. If we got rid of the storage units, there wouldn't be poverty in America. Amen. 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 If we gave to one another as they had a need. Instead of collecting so much that we need a storage unit, well, Clay, I don't have a storage unit. You got a barn, don't you? Uh, you got an attic? Yeah. You got, you got stuff where you can't even walk through your house? It's not hoarding, it's collecting. Right? He settled in. He settled. Settled in. The king had been settled into his palace. That means the boxes were unpacked. The, the, there, there was new stuff. And, and, and quite honestly, that probably means a new palace was built. So he settled in, and in that, he's still anxious. You see, and that's where we see a, a man after God's own heart. Even after he settled in, even after, he doesn't have a war to fight. What did God say? Right? His enemies around him had been taken care of. That, had been, that matter had been settled. The very thing that David's whole mission was about was conquering this land in the name of God and being the king of That had already been done. The Lord had already surrendered all his enemies, but still restless. Still restless, still, still sitting. And when he reclined in that big, big, beautiful Paj throne and all of the excess that was around him, he thought for a second and he said, I'm unsettled by the fact 
that I'm surrounded with all the glory and all the praise and all the blessings and all the labels that we put on it, right? I'm blessed by God living in the pale. Too blessed to be stressed on the front of my Lexus. Amen? <laughs> get, get out the Lexus and hair all a frizzle. Stressed out. That same tag, the one that run you off the street. Amen? Yeah. Right? Too blessed to be stressed. <laughs> get out of my way. Follow me to the First Pentecostal Church of Right? Now, I'm not saying anything about the Pentecostals. First Nazarene Church, Monticello, don't, don't get there. But too blessed to be stressed. David was still anxious. And he was anxious because he knew that everything that was provided for him, everything that he had that surrounded him, was a blessing and a gift from God. He was a shepherd boy. Shepherd boy. God put him where he was at. By his physical stature, by everything that he loved. He was just a kid. Do we remember the, the battle of David and Goliath? You know, one that we probably all heard a thousand times? That's David. Not kingly, not, not full stature. He, he, he's not addressed in the same way that Saul was, is he? When we talked about the selection of Saul as a king, we talked about all the masculinities and, and the physical prowess and and everything else, how he was this big, great, and, and appointed by, not David, right? Just a shepherd. So he realized that in and of himself, wasn't much to offer. But now he's sitting through all these victories, because he knew that all the victories that he won, the one against Goliath, he knew from a very early age, because that's how he claimed that victory, amen? amen. He walked in and he said, you come to me with spear and sword, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. Right? I come to you because, because I can't sit here walking up and down, feeding these guys their sandwiches, these big, strong, mighty guys that, that I think that are out there, these big warriors that are out there to protect the name of God, to stand for the name of God. I can't feed them because I hear, I hear some garbage going on in the background. And it bothers me that I'm hearing. What is this guy saying? He keeps throwing these insults out. I can't take it no more. I let them in. Like the Chihuahua. <laughs> Let me at it! Right? But a Chihuahua empowered by God means a lion every day. Amen. Every day. Amen. And he did. But the same anxiousness, the same motivation, the same structure in David's anatomy, his DNA, is the thing that's driving him right now to look around his himself and say, you know what? I think I, I want to do something for God. And loved ones, we, we get that, right? We get that. Do, 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 have we ever been in a place where we recognize everything that we had was a gift from God? I mean, maybe just about a second. Maybe we just noticed it for a few minutes. Maybe it was just when we got the keys to that new car. Or maybe when, it was when we just got that new job. Or, or when we just got that, that new sound equipment. Or we, or, or we got some new tires. Or we got, well, I don't know, some new stuff. And we, got the, we, we recognized God's provision and we were, yes! Praise God. Amen? I want to give something back. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. Now Nathan's not been the prophet up to this point. There was, a, there was another prophet for David throughout the whole ministry, and now Nathan kind of comes to the forefront in this scenario. That's a totally another message, but I did want to point that out, that this is kind of the first time we see Nathan. And Nathan as the prophet of David. He says to go ahead and do because he, he's confident in what, what Nathan is saying in that scenario is that I observe everything around you too. And, and, and as I observe everything around you, but matter, God's, God's hand is with you. God's hand is with what you're doing. So, so you go ahead and do that. But that night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. You think it was the same word? It was a different word. You see, he looked around, and too often it is that we observe sometimes, we might, we might observe a church, or we might look at, at our current circumstances, or we might even look at our financial statement or whatever, and we say, you know what, we're, we're, we're okay, and we're going to continue on this path, but, but then when a new word from God comes, something, something that's a little different, something that might challenge us to be a little different or to do something a little different, we, la, 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 la. we might not want to hear, we might not want to see that change, we might not want to experience that change. You see, because David had a motivation, and we know, we've heard the story, and some of you might not, and we're going to go through the story, but you know, David's motivation here was to build a temple. 
He wanted to do something for God, build something that was beautiful, much much grander than the than the house that he lived in. God deserved to be to to do much more, to have much more. But he didn't get that message from God. He didn't get that challenge from God. God didn't say, build me a house. God says much the opposite. He says, go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with an attempt as my dwelling. Whoever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people? And if you underline in your Bible, who I commanded to shepherd my people. Why have you not built me a house of cedar? God said, who, who of my leaders, who of my people have I ever said that I told to shepherd my people. Who of my people did I say build me a house of cedar? And we'll get to, to all the, the truths of that in just a second. Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people. He's reminding him where he came from. Amen? And we just talked about that he came from a shepherd. And I appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone. And I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great. Like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel. And will plant them so that they can have the home of their own. And no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did in the beginning and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all of your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and your rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. You see, too often it is we shift right into Solomon and Solomon's colonnade, Solomon's building of the temple because that was David's son. And that, and that though David wasn't going to build the temple, automatically Solomon was going to build the temple. And, and, and loved ones, there's truth to that. And that is what happened and that is what proceeded. But that's not what God's talking about here. How do I know? Continue to read. He is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Forever. Loved ones, Solomon doesn't rule anymore. Jesus ruled and rules forever. He's saying, and Jesus, and then what, what we kind of flash forward to, or, or in my mind, we, we, we zip into the New Testament and we get to a place where we talk about, you know, that Christ says, on this rock, I will build. Right? On the rock, the gospel truth, the understanding of the gospel truth, I will build. You are Petra. <coughs> I am Petra. We, on this rock, I will build, when he talks to Peter. At least that's where my mind goes. And within that, he's saying that Jesus will be established forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with flogging, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Now we go on and we start to read into David's response to that. And for the sake of time and where we're trying to get today, if you want to read David's response, please take that time. Please make a marginal note that, that you want to go back and read the prayer of David. Because what David does is simply almost regurgitate exactly what God had said to him and claims it. 
and says, let this be true, let this be true, let this be true. Let what Nathan is telling me right now, let that be true, Lord. Most of all, I just want to be obedient to you. Most of all, I just want to hear from you. Most of all, I just want to see your kingdom come. Don't believe it, read it, but don't read it right now. Because we've got somewhere else to go. Chapter 8 just really goes back in and establishes then after that, after that commitment and, and, and David's focus on not building God's temple, not building God's house of worship, not putting pews in or chairs in or remodeling or doing, just coming in and saying, shepherd my people, lead my people. Then we see all through chapter 8 a list of David's victories. One after another, after another, after another. Because God was with him and he was obedient to God and victories were the outcome. Amen? People who are obedient to God. Group people who are obedient to God. People who we call now the church will see victory after victory after victory. There will be a chapter listed of victories. Loved ones, if we're, not, if we're not building the book of victories right now and all we can do is look at what's in front of us in our defeats and, and what's in, in, in front of us is causing us not to be able to do, it's because we're looking at that circumstance. We're looking at the, the Philistine. We're, lo we're looking at the, the giant and, and not the Lord. Amen. We're looking at our current circumstance, our current situation, and not resting on, on God. Like we talked about with David's prayer life, where he started about his current circumstance, but by the end of it, he was saying, because, because you're God, just forget about everything else I just said. Amen? Man, our prayer life will become much more stringent, much more, much more powerful, and we'll be able to receive the things that God has for us when we stop clouding it all with that first, first part of the prayer. <laughs> and we can just get to the place where we're full surrender to God, and because God is God, we know. We know that His ultimate plan will come to fruition. The only thing we have is a choice whether to be a part of that ultimate plan or, or not through our obedience. Now, <clears throat> we kind of laid the groundwork for this a little earlier. <clears throat> now that David has had all these victories and that all the enemies have been wiped out, he looks around and he says, Anybody in Saul's house still alive? Which was quite often the case, like we talked about earlier. That, that, that's what they did as kings. They, they looked for the predecessors of, of, of the other regime, the other king, and they wanted to, of course, bring them in and do away with them. This is where we see a man after God's own heart once again. Now we see a man after God's own heart in the fact that after all the victories, he was sitting in his posh place. He was sitting in the place, and he didn't just sit in that place and say, this is all the stuff God's get, God gave me. Y'all want to come see all the stuff that God gave me? Y'all want to walk around and, and check out what, what God gave me? He said, I need to do something for God. I need to be missionally minded. I need, I need to be thinking about something to do back for God. And then God said, that's not what I want you to do right now. Right now, I want you to shepherd my people. I want you to, to love on my people. I want you to be able to, to be my presence in their presence. I want, to, I want you to be able to, to, to for people to look 2,000, 3,000 years from now and, and look back and say, we can see God's own heart. And David, these are the things that I want you to do. These are the things that, that are going to be written about. These are the things that are going to broadcast throughout infamy. Chapter 9. David asks, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul? And all the people around him said, ah, yeah, we, we're about, about, about to get real, right? We're, we're about to go ahead and get rid of Saul's bloodline and make sure that that's taken care of. Whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake. Flipped it on his head. You see, his motivation went from, I need to build something from, for God, physically. I, I, need to, I need to have some kind of structure, some kind of building, some kind of place where God's soul can rest, where God's peace can and, and instead of that, he realized in that that he became a conduit of what God wanted to do. And, and he reached out and he said, though those people tried to slay me, you know what? I'm a man of my word. And, and, and back when Jonathan and I were having conversations 
and in my heart how much I love Jonathan and how much Jonathan loved David. Loved ones, it's a reality. How much Jonathan, and Jonathan Saul's son, for, for anybody who might not know that, Saul's son, Jonathan, was very close to David, loved David, and even came to David and said, you know, I'm going to go to my dad and I'm going to try to help convince him that you're not, you're not after him, that you want to honor him and that you love him. And that if he's not hearing that, I'm going to come back and tell you that. I'm going to make sure that you know that he's, he's after you with wrong intent. And he said, but I do know, I do know because Jonathan served the Lord. Jonathan served the same God that David served. And loved ones, when we all serve the same God, we don't, we don't go off in, in, in these different directions. And though the, the circumstance might seem like he's on, he's on the wrong side, because there was nobody on the wronger side than Saul's family and David, just by circumstance. But when we serve the same God, it doesn't matter what side we're on, quote, what side we're on. When we serve God, God's plan overlaps. God's plan connects us. God's plan unites us. Amen. Just like it did David and Jonathan. And David did not forget that. David hadn't forgotten that. David said, you know what, I made a promise to Jonathan. And though I know beyond the shadow of a doubt in this war, a lot of Saul's people been done away with. I want to seek out. Seek. Seek out. Someone to give honor and blessing to. Because that's how God rolls. That's how God does it. That's what I want to do. Now there was a servant in Saul's house named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David, and the king said, Are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king asked, Is there no one still alive from the house of Saul whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He's lame in both feet. Not really a warrior. Not really someone that, you know, you could be really concerned with. Now we, we don't quite see Ziba's actions as a, a pointing, you know, until we take into consideration not only that when they called the people forward, when they, when they called the, the, the descendants of Saul forward, or, or, or the descendants of the pr preceding king forward, that the intention was always to wipe them out, right? Sometimes we, we know that, 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 that David ends up blessing, and he said he wanted to bless, and he actually does bless, and we forget about what Ziba's intent might have been in pointing him out. Oh, no, 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 no. We'll, we'll get there. Ziba answered, He's at the house of Makur, son of Amal, in Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Makur, son of Amal. When Mephibosheth, that's his name, I say it five times really fast, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. I don't know if you, you got the fact that he was crippled in both feet. Bowing down and the prostrating, and that wasn't an easy event for him. Coming, coming from the, the line of Saul, that, that was an even harder event for him. Not knowing what kings did to the descendants was even a harder. Can you imagine when that word, word first came? To my pills of that? David wants to see you. Uh-oh. See, he was only five years old when Jonathan was killed. He's about 20, 21 now. So there's been some time passed. And he thought, I'm good. I'm in the world. I'm, I'm outside of it. I, I'm, okay. I'm okay. Some other guy that's here stepped up, 
and evidently was was relational enough with Saul and Saul's family to, to bring in his crippled son and to you know give him a lifestyle, give him a, give him a place to worship, give him a place to, to to give sacrifices and join in with his family. You know, and we see that in, in the scripture that that Mephibosheth actually he, he had a, he had a son at this point, so life was okay. Life was pretty good. And then the past comes calling. At your service, he replied, don't be afraid, David said to them, for I'm surely, sir, I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Pilsabeth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and to bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And the pills of Beth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. He just got established with a pretty good work crew. Amen? <laughs> and where he was relying on someone from outside of the heritage to, to help provide for because he was crippled and living in that person's home. It didn't say that they went to Mephilzebeth's home, right? They went to Makira's home. Now he not only was established with his own home, but his own resources. Mephilzebeth had a young son named Mika. I think Makir, Mika, maybe some. All the members of Ziba's household, household were servants of Mephilzebeth, and Mephilzebeth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table, and he was lame in both feet. Now we say all of that to, to kind of get to a place where, what, what is it that, that's about David that, that kind of resembles or reflects God's own heart? What is it about, about David and David's acts here you know, as we've been studying on Wednesday nights, if you've been here, if you haven't, you know, you're missing out. As we've been studying, you know, God's architectural work throughout the Old Testament and New Testament, and you can see His hand throughout all of it, we know that, that this can't simply just be David offering Mephilzebeth a place to stay or giving him his grandfather's land. What we see actually in this act is the same dynamic of Jesus Christ. Reaching out to us, offering us in our crippled state, in our disconnected and discontented state, in our separated state, a place at the table. A place at the table. You see, though, though life seemed to be good from a Pillsbeth, and, and too often it is that we get off into the world and we think that there's some kind of connectivity between the two, the past always comes calling. And that past came calling in the form of David, but David was calling out like Christ calls out. He was saying, come from your place of comfort. Come from the place that you think is, is good, that you think is okay. It didn't say the pills of Beth was looking for something greater, desiring something greater. He had truly came from something greater, amen? His history was that he was the grandson of the king. He came from something greater, but he wasn't currently in that place. And David, like Christ, beckoned him come. And David, like Christ, said, come and participate. Come and eat at my table, though you're wounded. Though your fathers have transgressed. Come and sit at my table. And you see, he valued that. Mephilzebeth bowed down and said, what did he say? Loved ones, it's the same recognition that we must have. What is it? What is it? about us. What is it? What is your servant? Verse 8. What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Father God, what is it about me 
that you would want to pull me from that? What is it about me that you would desire to connect back with? What is it about me that you want to restore to a place that I can't, can't even remember? What is it about me, God? And he says it has nothing to do with you. It has to do with my love. Sit right here. You will always, always eat at my table. Always eat at my table. You see, but then the world comes and it, it starts to convolute things and it starts to, to build on and, and break us down and we go back to somehow, we recite back to it. David had, had done it and Pillsbeth had the opportunity to do it where we, we kind of reflect back and we, we get back to this place of, of building the buildings. Or having all that the world has to offer. The thing that's beautiful about Pillsbeth's journey we see it over in chapter 19. You see, we also see Ziba's intent. Because what had happened is David was going out and he was going to do a victory march. And everybody who ate at his table was a part of that victory march. And he intended from Elizabeth to be a part of it. And he's marching along and he, and he looks around and no, but Bill's back. He's not here. He's not participant. What's going on? Well, he's marching through and he passes the land. And when he passes the land, Ziva's out there and he, you know, he runs out and he, he's giving him a bunch of stuff that, that doesn't even belong to Ziva, matter of fact. Giving David a bunch of stuff. Does, does this analogy start to ring true where we get, we get out and into society and society starts to promise us a bunch of stuff that ain't, that ain't even societies to begin with? And, 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 and David is like, well, well, what's this stuff about? What, what, what is it that you're bringing me these donkeys and this food? And, and he starts to explain all this stuff. And he's like, well, where's Mephizabeth? And he's like, oh, well, well, he wants me out here. Because he wants, he wants, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> he, he wants me to get all that my grandfathers had. You see, he stole. He stole God's truth. God's truth through David was he wanted to restore Mephizabeth to all of his grandfather's riches. Ziba came in with a counterfeit. Read it. It's through chapter 19. He came in with a counterfeit and said, you know what, I want, I want to give you all of these stuff, David. I want to give back to you, which is the same thing that David's original motivation was, right? I want to build you a big palace. And Ziba comes in and says, I want to give to you, king, because, because what Mephizabeth wanted to do was restore my grandfather's stuff to me. False religion, false truth. That looks a lot like the, the real thing, though, right? The only difference was the giver. And the reality was Ezekiel was lying. The only reason Mephizabeth wasn't with David is because Ziba didn't get him on his horse. You don't believe it? Read it, read it through. Read it through. Ziba was his servant, but he didn't prepare Mephizabeth. Mephizabeth was crippled. He couldn't do His job was to prepare him to be on that horse so that he could ride with David and he could go out. He had a different plan. He had a different plan from the beginning. From the beginning, he thought, maybe, just maybe, if I deliver Mephizabeth over, maybe if I, I deliver him over to the king, the king will, and then I can take what's rightfully mine. Now we see his, his true intent here. And then even in that we see, we see the beautiful heart of David around verse 19. <clears throat> Let's say verse 26. He said, My Lord the King, since I, your servant, am lame, I said I will have my donkey saddled and will ride on it so I can go with the king. But Ziba, my servant, betrayed me. And he slandered your servant to my Lord the King. My Lord, the King is like an angel of God. Do So do whatever you wish. You repay him. You, you do whatever you wish. All my grandfather's descendants deserve nothing but death from my Lord, the King. Do you get that beauty? Do you get that beautiful analogy? None of my descendants none deserved anything. The only thing that they deserved was judgment, but your grace. Amen. 
That's important to me. But you gave your servant a place among those who eat at your table. Are we getting the analogies? <laughs> so what right do I have to make any more appeals to the king? The world lied to me. The world crippled me up. Lord, I wanted to be with you, and the Lord and the world, the world had deceived me. What what right do I have to ask you for anything else, God? You've already given everything. What what I truly deserved? Do you see the beauty in, in this? What I truly deserved was death. What I truly deserved was separation. What I truly deserved was not a place at your table. But you offered me a place at your table. And if you still have a if you still have a place at your table available, all this other. All, the, all this other means nothing if you still have a place at your table. We'll see the beauty of that right here. The king said to him, why say more? I ordered Ziba to divide the land. He even said, you know, whatever. So, so that he's out of here, so that he's done. He's chosen his path. And he thinks that all the land and all the stuff that he has is going to be... You see, there's a dividing place right there. There's a choosing place right there. There's a reality of the believer. And just because someone may look successful, like Ziba right here, Ziba successfully got half of what Mephibosheth had, successfully got it, but he was headed to hell. So it meant nothing. It meant nothing. So we see the beautiful analogy of the truth right here. And then, and then what happens? The Pilsabeth says, yeah, that's not fair. It's not fair that the world gets half of what I... Why does he get half of what was mine? Can you read further? That's not true. The Pilsabeth said to the king, I didn't have all of it. Now that you're back, I don't know if you get that, loved one. Let him take everything now that my Lord, the King, has returned home safely. You're more important. All you established for me, all you gave to me, all those things, that didn't mean nothing. You're here. Loved ones, if we're not sitting there like Mephibosheth, crippled up, saying, boy, I wish I could go on this victory ride. But man, if I can't go on this victory ride in this earth, I know that when he comes back, all this won't matter. None of this matters. The buildings. The mortgages. The land. The houses. Nothing. It means nothing. If he's coming back. He can have it all. The world can have it all. I'm just happy he's coming back. And I'm going to rejoice that he's coming back. You see, the beauty of all of that is, is that there is also within the scenario, there, there was another Mephilsbeth. Funny enough, there were two. But David knew the right one. Christ knows the right one. You, you can look like you can even have the same name. But if you come in here and you're playing at it, believe me, God knows the true appeals man. God knows it. Twenty one, if you just want to know, it's second Samuel twenty one seven where it talks about the other. So you can challenge me on it or Google it. With all that said, what does it mean? What does it mean? Clay, you said you were going to tell us why you're a horse. Okay, here it goes. Uh, by the pictures out back, I guess you might have aware, been aware that our Spanish church celebrated something here last night. What, we have a Spanish church? Yep. They celebrated their fifth anniversary here last night. And your pastor's got to be honest with you. We didn't know about it right up front. Didn't know that, I mean, I, I didn't even know they'd been here that long. Nor, nor did I know that they had plans to celebrate an event 
in the communication barrier lacked it. So, so Saturday we find out that they have an event. I mean, or, or for Saturday during the day, Friday night, Saturday during the day, we find out that they got an, an, an event that they are doing, and and man, you, you start to scramble. You, well, we got all this VBS stuff. Well, we worked all day getting that stuff set up. Well, I tell you what, you know, your pastor was going to show up last night and make sure that they didn't mess that stuff up. <laughs> 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 and I walked in the building and, you know, y'all know that um, my history is church planning and I've shared with some of you that, you know, one of the things that I would take my core groups to, when we would get together as a, as a group of people that said we want to start a work for God, that, that I would take that core group of people to a Korean church or Spanish church or to worship. Just to worship, where you don't understand the words. You don't know the words. Because God's God regardless of the words. Amen. And if you can't worship without the words, and I'd forgotten, loved ones, what it was like to worship without the words. And I came in, and I'm ready. You know, I don't know if I need to draw on a piece of paper. This is X off. If I need to write exiendo or whatever it is on the wall, I don't, I don't even know what exit means in Spanish. But I got to say, don't mess up, BBS. <laughs> and I came in, and there was a guy up here, and everybody just kind of meandering around, and there was stuff going on. And, and I was like, man, you know, I got, I got to make sure. All right, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to wait for my opportunity. I'm going to let them do what they're going to do. God bless them. But then I'm going to make sure they don't mess up our BBS. And God showed up. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And I got to watch people start to come in. And, you know, you might wonder, you might wonder why after the Spanish church has been here, why, you know, maybe our little pamphlets are all turned around and this stuff is all twisted and turned. You know, you know what? I found out last night why it is. It's because everyone who walks in here from our Spanish church does this when they come in. Amen. Everyone of them. And I got up there and they started to sing and it's loud. I mean loud. Very loud. It's like mariachi. <clears throat> you ever been, you know, where you're, where you're at the restaurant, you're just trying to have a romantic night, and you're like, okay, give them the $5 so they will shut up. <laughs> Amen. I mean, we can be real, right? <laughs> just go, just go, just go. No, no, hold on, hold on. And they started to sing and I, and I looked like the... Y'all know who the person is. Y'all have the... Where that's your jam, but you don't quite know all the words. <laughs> that's why I'm hoarse. Because I ain't know the words. But I, I don't be all about me, but I all about me. I didn't know the words. But I was making some kind of noise. Because the spirit was moving. I mean, I just didn't know. They didn't look at me funny, so I guess I was at least halfway right. <laughs> well, they couldn't hear me because it was so loud. And about the time I worshipped and, and was not even in, you know, in, in my own mind because there was no words that I understood. There was just a, a Christos that I kept hearing about. A Gloria Christos, a Gloria Christos. And it started permeating into my mind. I was like, oh my gosh. My, I don't know when's the last time I've been in worship when I, when I was thirsty. And, uh, and about that time a guy tapped me on the shoulder and handed me a bottle of water. Really? Like they, they, they knew that when we worship, we need some water. <laughs> I say all that to say within this analogy, if we are just going to build a house for God, if that's our focus, is to build a building for God and be worried about the pristineness of the building for God or what our work was out back for God, then we might as well turn the key on the building and go to the social club. 
I walked in the back of that door thinking in my head when I walked in and there were children. Uh, I, o M G. <laughs> there are babies standing in the pews with shoes on. <laughs> I left there saying, oh my God, there's babies in the pews. Worshiping God. If we don't get that, there's no need to do anything else. No need to do anything else. Let's just close the doors and go home. Because the plight of this world says, and that the analogy that came into my mind, and this is, you know, I'm a little cookie sometimes, was God working in my heart, I don't think he was speaking in Spanish, but if he was, I understood him. <clears throat> he said, Clay, you know, you've heard the analogy of the guy being in the boat and tossing out the, the lifesaver and so on and so forth and, you know, to, to his son or to the other guy. Or this, you know, and he said, you know, really, if you have to battle, battle with that idea, then you're not shepherding my people. And what, what, what's the analogy? The analogy that he gave me was, you know, if you're standing in this lifeboat, you're standing in a boat and the torrential storms are out there. And you've got one raft. And there's a non-believer that's thrashing at the water, cursing and screaming at you to throw him the raft. And there's your son that's saved, that knows Jesus Christ, thrashing in the same waves. Who are you going to throw the lifesaver? And if I have to battle with that decision at all, that's not God's own heart. Because God looked away from His Son. Looked away from His Son and threw the wrath to the belligerent. We need to throw the wrath to the belligerent and let God deal with the saved. Loved ones, we have got to step up as people, as people of God, and start believing God. Believing God in what way? Believing God that, that if it's time for my son to perish, that, and he knows God, then hallelujah. But this